The sanctity of human life is under assault. Find out how and what you can do about it in this edition of Life Matters with Brian Johnston, Western Regional Director of the National Right to Life Committee. Brian Johnston has been a teacher at every academic level, from adult education and junior college down through high school, junior high, and even fifth and sixth grade. As is so often the case with teachers, he has also coached. Many on the California pro-life team call him the life coach. Today, you'll find out why on Life Matters. And now here's our host, Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters, your program on the right to life, on the culture, and the very real battle of ideas. And if you don't think there's a battle going on, you're in trouble. Because that battle is for ideas that you think. If you're not prepared to understand and grapple with these ideas, it's not a metaphor. Lives are at stake. This is a real battle. I have back Alex Schadenberg, a very good friend, leader of the Youth in Asia Prevention Coalition. He's based in Canada, so he's got a funny accent, <laughs> but, but I enjoy it very much. Love him dearly. Alex, thanks for being back. It's good to be with you, eh? Yeah, hey, mate. Listen, we know, and, and I wish the major media would discuss it more, but both California and Canada now have legalized assisted suicide. I think in Canada, it took off like wildfire, part of my theory is that you already had a government-sponsored health care program where the government decides what kind of care you get. And it's been pretty scary, the things I've heard out of Canada. Tell us what's going on. Well, there's been lots of abuse or, I would just say, extension of the law, because the law was set up and didn't take very long for the very first court case to be launched to challenge it, because the law says that it's supposedly for people who are terminally ill. But this is being challenged already. So there's been several court cases already. Now they're debating in Canada whether or not children should have euthanasia. And in Canada, it's euthanasia, not so much assisted suicide. The difference is so minor. But I will say quickly what the difference is. Euthanasia is when the doctor lethally injects you, whereas assisted suicide is when that same doctor would give you the same drugs, but technically you have to take it yourself. So it's an assisting of a suicide. Mm. They're, they're the same sort of things. The doctor's involved directly with causing death in both cases. Mm -hmm. So now in Canada, they're debating extending euthanasia to children, to people with dementia, and also to people who clearly just have psychological issues and who are not terminally ill at all. Mm -hmm. And th this is a vast expansion. One of the reasons you, you think it has to do with the medical system, it's partially that. It had more to do with the fact that Canada was inundated with the pressure to legalize universally on, uh, through the media and through the government. This was something that came at us in a constant, uh, how would you say, a constant sort of brainwashing mm -hmm. that this was a good thing. The other thing that's so important is this, it's the same idea as what's happening in California. The law, what it was sold as, and the law, what it says, mm -hmm. are two different things. It's two very different things. So in Canada, for instance, people are saying, oh, this is my body, my choice, it's my autonomy. I can do with my body what I want. Don't stand in my way. But the law, when you read the law, it gives, first of all, doctors total anonymity, total, total, total protection mm -hmm. in every way, shape, and form, even when they intentionally make an error. And secondly, it gives total power to the doctor. So people are thinking, oh, this is all about my body, my choice. Mm -hmm. And really what the law says is, the doctor has the right to cause your death. And the fact is, is that we try to deal with these things and people come from the theory and they say, oh, well, I don't want to suffer. Well, guess what, Brian? I don't want to suffer either, sure. but I want to be properly cared for, but I don't want to give the power over my life to physicians or even worse in some cases, the bean counters in the medical system. Right. And that's what you're facing. And we're being pressured in the U.S. to face the same thing. It's all about cost. There's another issue that I know in California, Oregon, and Washington, even though it's about suicide and someone's desires, there's no requirement for a psychological workup. This person isn't required to be counseled, and yet we know the desire for suicide is the number one indicator. Suicidal ideation, psychologists will tell you, that indicates a very deep depression. And they're not right. being treated for that depression. And That's yeah, exactly it. Yeah. And so, of course, if you get a terminal diagnosis, we know you're going to get depressed. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about that in 1969 in the five stages that people go through. A lot of times people go through those stages and they need help. She wrote the book because often we really do need help. But instead, medicine gives them a killing dose. This is absolute abandonment of the medical profession. It's the abandonment of the medical ethics. It's the reason we honor physicians 
and we treat them with respect is because of the ethics of medicine, that they would only care for people. That is now gone. That's been robbed from our culture. We talked in another program, and tell us again, you, you know of a nurse that was involved in this. Yes, uh, Christina Hodges. She was involved in causing the death of her patients, and this was before it was legal. Mm-hmm. And she came to realize that what she was doing, see, she didn't realize it. She was thinking that this was normal sort of palliative care. And of course, palliative care can be good palliative care, where it cares for your pain mm-hmm. and your symptoms, and make sure you have a good death. And then there's the abuse of palliative care, that palliative care which causes death. And And Christina was involved in that, and she didn't realize at first that she was, in fact, causing death until one day she woke up and realized what was happening. And she said, like, what am I doing? What am I doing? We produced the video, The Euthanasia Deception, to respond Mm -hmm. to the lies in the euthanasia lobby, and it's done incredibly well. We've sold thousands of copies in Canada, the U.S., and throughout Mm -hmm. the world, actually, Australia, New Zealand. But the purpose for that was is to show people, well, this is what it's really about. You see it's actually a lie. It's a deception. It's to get you to buy into something that, in fact, is not occurring. What actually happens when they've legalized this is what is in California and in Canada is the doctors have now gained the right to cause your death. They've gained the right in law, and they've gained, how would you say, a legal anonymity, meaning if they do something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Canadian law is so clear. Even if they do something that was reasonably mistaken, meaning... They cause your death intentionally, but it was under the reasonably mistaken belief they've got no fear of reprisal. But guess what? The person is dead now. Mm -hmm. The person is dead. If you never asked for it, but the doctor thought you asked for it, they just have to say, according to the law, it was my reasonably mistaken belief that they had requested it. That's right. It's all craziness. It's insane. It's insane. But we've bought into this idea based on the flag that was waved which is the cultural, how would you say, zeitgeist, which is choice and autonomy. Mm -hmm. So we Mm -hmm. bought into that because that's what we want. That's right. No, I think for anyone, this is exactly what we're seeing in California and along the West Coast, Oregon and Washington. If you want to see where it goes, go to the Netherlands. And we've talked about it before in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Switzerland. Individuals are being killed when there's nothing wrong with them. Nothing. Individuals are being killed when they haven't requested it. In the Natty Boomsma case in the Netherlands, It went to the high court of the Netherlands where a physician killed a nun who was sleeping. And the reason he did it is he felt that she, because of her religion, couldn't and wouldn't ask for it. But it's what was really necessary for her. This is really showing love and compassion. That went to the high court and he was honored as a good physician. This is a recipe for disaster. And if you're not awake and paying attention to these ideas, you're just going to walk into this fog and off of the cliff and your loved ones will be at risk when they go into any medical facility. Medicine has become a killing implement. So please understand the great, great risks that are at stake in this battle. Yeah, that's exactly it, Brian. And the fact of it is, is that once it becomes culturally the norm, then where does it go from there? And who's to know? Like there was a recent case in the Netherlands of a woman who had, how would you say, a psychiatric condition where she could not handle any dirt being around her. Mm. And so she asked for euthanasia because she had been losing her eyesight. She was having degeneration, macular degeneration. She was Mm. becoming blind. And she said that the psychological distress from not knowing whether or not she was clean And they gave her euthanasia based on no health condition because she was in fear of dirt. Think about this. My my mom is Dutch, so I understand this this clean freak thing. But the num- <laughs> but is that a reason to kill someone? And that's yeah. really what it is, eh? Let's get down to it. That's what it, it's killing. This is very frightening. And understand that as you listen to this program, your medical profession has been impacted by this way of seeing, this way of thinking. They're not able to escape this unless they are part of a Christian medical association or the Catholic medical association. They're being encouraged and taught these ethics. So you need to understand you're the final advocate. The law is not going to protect the vulnerable. You must protect your family members. We're living in a changed society, much as it was. In olden time, the family is the first defense. If you're not ready, if you're not willing to say, I'd like a second opinion. No, I'd like to bring in a a pain management specialist. If you're not willing to step up, if you're not willing to question the guy in the white smock or the lady with the stethoscope, you're surrendering everything to them. And we're talking about life and death. I'm going to have Alex back in just a little bit. I'm going to have Alex talk about his film more and how you can get a hold of that film. I'm a big fan of film, as Alex knows. So we'll be right back with Alex Shaddenberg. You're listening to Life Matters. 
If you have questions or comments for Life Matters, call 800-924-2490. Give us your name and the town you're calling from and a quick question or comment. Power, power, power. You're pro-life and you want to defend your position, but you're not sure what to say. That's pretty common. So get the facts you need to back up your pro-life position with the Power of 7 app. The Power of 7 gives you effective pro-life replies to seven of the most common pro-abortion arguments. It's simple, it's easy to use, and it's free. Download it now at thepowerof7.org. The Power of 7, the number 7.org. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Get back with Alex Shattenberg, leader of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, based in Canada, but I've met with Alex and all over the world because this is a worldwide battle of ideas. There's a battle for our culture, not just for the laws of your nation, but for our culture and what's at stake in Western culture. Alex, there's a great film that EPC has produced. Tell us about it. Yeah, the Euthanasia Deception documentary. It's 52 minutes long, so it's not overly long. It's been sold all over the world, but heavily in Canada and the U.S., thousands of copies. And it needs to get out even further because the fact is, is it deals with real-life stories. Mm -hmm. What we did is we sent a film crew to Belgium who interviewed people with real-life stories dealing with euthanasia in Belgium. And then we interviewed Canadians. This was before euthanasia became legal in Canada. We did Mm -hmm. did these interviews. And we put together the euthanasia deceptions so you hear from real-life stories what affects this question. For instance, Lionel Roosman talking about his daughter. Mm -hmm. He's in Belgium. His daughter is, at the time of the filming, was 20 years old, has multiple disabilities. And he's saying, you know, the culture in Belgium has changed. We walk through the park with our daughter in a wheelchair, and people ask us, why have you not euthanized your daughter? Wow. And that, that, seems, that seems absolutely ridiculous, and yet he's saying what's happened is the culture has shifted because killing has become totally acceptable. And if you think about the whole thing of Hank Reisma talking about his grandfather, Hank's grandfather had cancer. But Hank's grandfather was in no way wanting euthanasia. What mm-hmm. happened is a doctor said to Hank's grandmother, you know, do you want him to be kept comfortable? Because this could be a difficult situation. And she says, yes. You know, she was trusting of the doctor. She says, yes, do what needs to be done. She did not realize that what he was thinking is killing her husband. Mm-hmm. She had no idea. This affected, like, so what happened is he ended up dying without any request by euthanasia. Mm. And, and what happened is not in the film, though, but if you know Hank, he would tell you that it affected her so much that years later, when she was getting to the point of having health conditions, she went to a nursing home two hours away from her home because it was run by a religious institution mm-hmm. and she knew her life would never be threatened there. You know, these, yeah. these are the kind of things. Alex, you've hit a couple of points there. And tell us where to get it. CaringNotKilling.com. You go to CaringNotKilling.com and, and all the booking information is there. So it's very easy to order. Excellent, excellent. I want to remind you, you heard that one story that took place in the Netherlands, perhaps it was Belgium, and it seems stunning that someone would go to the parent of a disabled child and suggest, well, why haven't you euthanized them? Part of the reason is that those countries have government-sponsored care, health care, And so they see disabled people as using up their tax money. You're using up their health money. They resent it. And the best way is simply to be rid of these costly people. That's the culture that's now in Europe, and that's the culture that has now crept into your society. Alex, you're awesome. Thank you so much for your help. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much, Brian. You're listening to Life Matters. Do you have a question about the right to life? Call our lifeline anytime at 800-924-2490 or visit us online at lifematters.life. Life Matters is sponsored by the California Pro-Life Council, the state affiliate of the National Right to Life Committee. To find out more on how you can help and be involved right where you are, go to californiaprolife.org. That's californiaprolife.org. We'll tell you how you can get involved in your local community, how you can be effective if you want to be a pro-life speaker. We have training programs and open doors of opportunity for you to speak on the life issue. If you'd like to donate your car or a boat, you can do that at californiaprolife.org. Car easy makes it easy, and you find that on our website. We get the most of any donation program. Car easy allows us to get the most out of your car. Maybe you're not getting the 
the trade-in value you want it. Maybe it's just not running the way it used to. Let your car be used for life. Go to californiaprolife.org and find out what you can do to make a difference. californiaprolife.org. Be sure to subscribe to the Life Matters podcast with Brian Johnston. Go to lifematters.life to subscribe. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Well, welcome back to Life Matters, your program on life, on culture, and the very real battle of ideas. And we're here to help you, to equip you in that battle. I am honored to be back in New Mexico. We're at the Right to Life New Mexico conference. And I'm very pleased to have a good friend and a frequent guest on the program in the past, Carol Tobias, the president of the National Right to Life Committee. Carol, it's great to have you on. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be back on. Yeah. You know, we were talking informally about what's ahead for the Right to Life movement. We've seen a dramatic change because of President Trump. We're very appreciative of President Trump, an astounding man, and very proud of him and what he's done, his appointments, and he's kept his word. And so now we're looking at 2018. There's things that Congress has done. You know, Congress gets a short stick, I think, from the media and from a lot of other people, because if you aren't paying attention to what really goes on, it seems like not much is going on. But in fact, they passed the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, which I think is hugely significant. The House of Representatives has passed the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, which wasn't really a surprise because we have so many wonderful pro-life members of Congress. It has been introduced into the Senate, and uh, we do expect a floor vote, but we don't know when. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's definitely going to be the tougher battle because we need 60 votes to overcome a filibuster. And we know that the Democratic senators are going to filibuster. Mm -hmm. But we are still going to fight. We're still going to make this an issue. We want all of those senators' constituents to know whether or not their senators support killing unborn babies who have developed to the point where they can experience pain. There's a substantial body of evidence that said that is at least by 20 weeks after fertilization. Mm -hmm. So we want to make this an issue. We want the senators to take a stand. Do they really think it's okay to kill unborn babies at that stage? That's right. And I think it's important for listeners to remember that we had a similar challenge on the Partial Birth Abortion Act that when initially presented, we didn't win, but ultimately we did. The real advantage to fighting for pro-life legislators to speak for you is that these issues get examined. And so what happens in the Senate, as Carol said, we don't know. It's very tough slogging there. The exciting thing, though, is we have a president who will sign it if it does come out, and that clearly will challenge and take down Roe v. Wade. And that means the dam will break and we'll be able to protect unborn children again. So it's very important the work that's gone in to electing pro-life congressmen and people to the Senate is to make sure that there is a voice for the voiceless. So in 2018, we're going to have a lot of discussion about these issues. I think having it debated, just as the Partial Birth Abortion Act, really exposed. Do you remember when Barbara Boxer was incensed because Rick Santorum showed a graphic and it was medically accurate of what happened? And Barbara Boxer said, how immoral for you to show that when there were minors present. The pages were in the Senate. She was not incensed about killing the child and sucking the brains out of that child. That, I think, was really a, you might say, a spiritual issue. And I think it spelled the death knell for Barbara Boxer. It showed how radical this issue is. And I think we'll have that same opportunity if we show the facts and the facts are on our side. We win, ultimately. But we have to have the people there to demonstrate these truths. We don't want anyone to misunderstand. The pro-life movement wants to protect all unborn children. Yes. The Supreme Court right now is not allowing us to do that. But if we can hit the weak points for the other side... Exactly. Now, in my opinion, all of their positions, all of their reasonings are weak. But for the American public... To be able to look at something like this and say, you know, protecting babies who can feel pain is reasonable. It's common sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know why anyone wouldn't support that. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a way for us to reach to the American public, to those people who may be conflicted about abortion. 
They're not sure they like it. They're not sure they want to make it illegal. They wouldn't get an abortion, but they're not going to stop anyone else from doing it. We need to reach those people and show them how radical, how hardcore, how extremist the abortion movement is in this country. That's right. And something like the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act and making senators take a position on that bill is a great way to do that because many people in the country would be horrified to find out, first of all, that the abortions are even happening. Yes. And second, that the people that they might have supported in the last election are actually supporting this crazy you know, action of killing these babies. That's right. Uh, so there's a lot of different reasons for doing something like this. That's right. Certainly we want to protect these babies, but we also want to use it as an educational tool Definitely. so that people realize what is happening to these children in our country. That's right. And I think you made a good point that this isn't the end of our debate. This isn't our final bill. In fact, just as we did win with partial birth abortion, by passing that, we weren't saying all the other abortions are okay. Quite the opposite. We are taking ground back. And particularly in the hearts and minds of our fellow citizens, our fellow Americans, really don't examine the abortion issue. And we know the media doesn't want to examine it. They're intellectually dishonest. They use buzzwords. They don't talk about what happens to that unique individual. And it's our job to do it. As a local pro-lifer, it's your job, too. So when this comes up, make sure that you're informed. You can get all the information at nrlc.org and get all the information on the specifics of the pain that the child feels. And there's dozens of articles and dozens of medical articles that are connected there. Find out who your state affiliate is at nrlc.org and get plugged in, get involved. Carol, what are some of the other things we'll be looking at in 2018? Well, definitely the biggest issue, I think, or the biggest project for pro-lifers needs to be the elections. Mm -hmm. We need to change the law. Because, yes, we can have abortionists who decide that they're just going to quit. They either retire or, you know, move on to something else. But it wouldn't stop anyone from coming back and starting up another abortion facility. We need to change the law so that the babies are protected and abortionists can't hang out their shingle and, and keep killing babies. So we need to pass laws. We need to elect the candidates who will vote for those pro-life laws. Mm -hmm. There are so many things we can be doing. We, of course, need to be educating our friends and our family members. We need to be going into our churches with the pro-life message and making sure that our you know, fellow church members understand what is happening with the life issues. Education, legislation, political action, you know, praying, of course, for all the women who are trying to make that difficult decision. The pregnancy resource centers are doing fantastic work. We need to help them. So there is a lot to be doing. But if we can't change the law, abortions will continue because Mm -hmm. there will be someone who is going to be setting up that abortion facility. Planned Parenthood needs to be stopped. Yes. We need to take away their money. You know, we've had some setbacks in Congress that we weren't expecting Mm -hmm. this year, but I still think we need to keep building on what we have. We don't want any setbacks. We don't want to start going backwards. The pro-life movement, I believe, is truly on the march. Yes. We are moving forward, we are attracting new people, and we just need to keep doing what we've been doing. That's right. No, the president has kept his word, and we're very pleased. He's making appointments that are pro-life appointments at every level, really, from what I have seen. And so that means we've got to do our work in preparing for the future. The future depends on what we do now. So a national right to life is there with the tools and the resources. This coming year, National's Convention is going to be where? Do you remember? The National Convention will be in just outside of Kansas City, Kansas, actually in Overland Park. Oh, great. But it's a great location. Our affiliate, Kansans for Life, is excited. They are working on this. They are already pulling in the volunteers and everything that they need to make sure that this is a success, working, of course, with some of the staff members at our office in Washington, D.C. It is the end of June. I don't have the exact dates right in front of me, but it's pretty much the last weekend of June 2018. And I would love to see everybody that's listening to this show up at that convention. That's right. No, if you haven't been to a National Right to Life convention, it's really the pro-life family of this nation meeting. And people of diverse backgrounds, but committed to one thing, to restore legal protection for the vulnerable innocent. 
And it's very exciting. You will learn more. I have learned more in National Right to Life workshops than I ever learned in all of my education. And it's really well worth it. It's a great, if you're on a summer trip with your family and wherever you're hearing this, if you're on podcast, this is a great location because it's the center of the nation. So it's exciting. It is. The convention, it will run for three days. We will bring in speakers to do general sessions. And then, of course, there are a lot of workshops with different topics. And whether you want to learn more about fundraising in the pro-life movement or education, the pregnancy resource centers, how to reach out to your church. It's just a broad variety, you know, how to use the social media to advance the pro-life message. Mm -hmm. There are just so many different opportunities there. And plus, we've got daycare for younger children. The National Teens for Life Convention is going on at the same time. We usually have some college students there that are active. Sometimes they might participate in the adult part of the convention. Other times they might have their own sessions. But there's there's just so much going on. I believe it is nrlconvention.com. And right now, at this point, it's probably going to be just you know, the dates and the the city, the location. But throughout the coming, you know, several months, just go back and check and see what's going on. Excellent. Now, it'll be great. Well, Carol, it's been good to talk with you, and it's great to be in your state of New Mexico. And thank you for all the work that you do. Happy to do it. This is a calling that so many people in this country have felt the same and are making a difference. And it's just wonderful to be a part of it. You're listening to Life Matters, your program on the right to life on culture, and the battle of ideas. And remember, if you're standing for the right to life, the facts are on your side. And facts are terrible things to waste. You know, if you're listening in, please remember that we're on the air because of your help. If you could, help us out. Tell us what station you're listening on, or if you're listening to podcasts. We want to make sure we're meeting your needs. Let us know if you have any questions or comments. You can write to us at P.O. Box 935. Sacramento, California, 95812. Or if you'd like to call the pledge, you could call our 800 number, 800-924-2490, and let them know that you want to pledge, and a volunteer will get back to you. And if you have any questions, feel free to include those as well. If you know someone whose life has felt the searing cut of abortion, we have some resources to offer you. Terry Reiser's book, A Solitary Sorrow, is a dynamic tool for finding healing and wholeness after abortion. And we'd be glad to send that along to you for any donation of $10 or more. Call California Pro-Life at 800-924-2490 or visit www.californiaprolife.org. Learn more about everything in today's show online at lifematters.life where you'll find all the resources you need to protect life. To subscribe to the Life Matters podcast, go to lifematters.life, where you'll find out a lot more about life, culture, and the battle of ideas. Life Matters is a production of California Pro-Life Council, the state affiliate of National Right to Life.